hoping some of you are curious about the title because I've saved the explanation for the very end, so I'll keep your interest because you're, you're waiting to find out why I'm taking Outrageous Outreach for 100. All right, so the slide you all wanted to see, the About Me slide. So um, my name is Sarah Heimlich. I just finished my master's in computing at Macquarie University in Sydney, Australia, where I've lived for the past 10 years. I was one of the founders as a high school student of 3132, um, which was the first team in Australia. Went on to win the Championship Chairman's Award in 2017. Um, I am a software engineer at Google now, and some fun facts about me are clearly up there. I like Brooklyn Nine-Nine and Jane Austen, so if you have any questions about either of those, please come talk to me afterwards, because I'd love to talk about it. All right, so the agenda today is based around three big questions that I get asked all the time. These are, what should we do? How do we get started? And how do we get more people involved? So hopefully you have one of those questions in your head when you signed up for the session, and hopefully I'm going to be able to answer it today. All right, so this is my standard disclaimer that I put on every presentation that I have, because a lot of people say, oh, Sarah, you're in the Hall of Fame. You are on a Hall of Fame team. Surely you know stuff we don't know. No, I don't. I'm very sorry to say. I know nothing more than you do. There's no secret sauce, no secret recipe that I'm going to share with you today. Um, this is just some philosophy and things that have worked in the past. So this is kind of how we did things on 3132 and some of the stuff that I've started bringing over to 971 this season. All right, one final thing before we get to the meat of it. And that's if you're doing chairmans to win chairmans and you're not doing chairmans, which is an oxymoron and can't be true by definition, but I think it has a bit of truth in there. And what it really means is that if you're doing things in the outreach space for the chairman's award, then you're actually not doing what chairman's is about. Chairman's is about inspiring the community, and that should be your goal. Your goal should not to be to get a blue banner at the end of the season. So while this talk is about outreach, I'm sure everyone is thinking about chairman's and engineering inspiration. And so I think this is really important to say. It's about your motivation. All right, so with that out of the way, what should we do? That's the first question. Well, I'm going to contradict myself a few times here in this talk, and this is my first one. And that's, if you look at the chairman's award definition, one of the things it says it's for is measurable impact. And I think that that's the thing that you should be focusing on, is what impact are we having and how can we measure it? So on 3132, we had a saying. It was, where's the impact? Like the old Wendy's commercial. See, I'm older than I look. What? Yeah, where's the beef? Just like my slide. So just like where's the beef, where's the impact? And if a project you're doing isn't having impact, then it probably isn't actually worth doing because why are you doing it? It's all about having that measurable impact. So that's something that we're constantly looking at is what is the impact, how can we measure it, and are we having an impact? Because if we're not, we need to change something and do it differently. All right, the second thing I think you should be doing is stealing from the best and inventing the rest, which for those of you who've been doing FRC for a while might know is a key saying of Citrus Circuits, 1678 from Davis. Um, so I think this actually also applies to outreach and those sorts of things as much as it applies to the robot. And I have a bit of an example here. So on the left here is the 2017 3132 Chairman's video, and on the right is a Nike ad. Um, so. If I play at least the beginning bit, oh, I don't have sound. OK, you're going to miss it. But um, these slides will be up. I encourage you to go watch them. The 3132 2017 chairman's ad is actually based on this Nike ad. And if you watch them, you can see the similarities. The entire voiceover for the chairman's video was based on the style of this video. The music was chosen to mimic this video. The shots were taken to mimic it, yes. It's not plagiarism because we're being inspired by it. We didn't actually copy anything from this. We copied the concepts. So concepts are OK to copy, but uh, actual text wouldn't. It's not like we said, just do it. So it's inspired by it. Um, this happens all the time in creative media. Like material design, right? That's a, technically a Google thing, but you'll see it across lots of products now. So yes, creative similarities. Highly encourage you to watch both of them. If you don't want to go find the slides, the chairman's video is pretty easy to find. And you can find this uh, Nike ad by Googling uh, if you can run a mile. All right, so now inevitably what happens is someone comes to me and says, oh, OK, 
So we got it. We need to go steal from the best and invent the rest. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at all the teams who've done really, really well with chairmans recently. So um, they went to China. So we're going we're gonna to go to China, or we're going to find some other country that we're going to go to. Or, oh, they, they did all this work with women. And this picture really isn't great in this country. But um, this is actually, she's a really famous Australian politician. Um, so we're going to work with government. Or we're going to get involved with sponsors like Google, a, a big name. That, that's going to do it for us. Or, oh, did you know 3132 went into the Outback? Clearly, that is the key. Can't forget about the first progression, first Lego League. And obviously, the absolute key is handing out little tiny koalas and getting them everywhere. And if we do all these things, we will win a blue banner. We're going to win it all. No. <laughs> Clearly, that's not quite what we're saying here. And I think the key thing to remember is steal from the best, yes, be inspired by it, but invent the rest. So really, what should you do? The answer is, I don't know. Because it depends on your team and your circumstances, and those are all things that I can't know. But I do know that the key is to pave your own path. To go and find things that no one else is doing, to find problems no one else is looking at, and start looking at solutions to those. So when I say steal from the best and invent the rest, don't forget the invent the rest, and to pave your own path. So what should we do? My three answers. Focus on measurable impact, steal from the best and invent the rest, and pave your own path. All right, now the second question. How do we get started? This one, actually, I have a catchy answer to. So the first part of it is evaluate. Um, so like I said, I can't know what you should do because I don't know your circumstances. So you need to go and evaluate it. You need to look at both what your strengths and your weaknesses are. You're probably thinking, well, how do we start doing that? So there's actually a business tool called a SWOT analysis, or S-W-O-T, and it looks at your strengths, your weaknesses, your opportunities, and your threats. Your strengths and weaknesses are internal to your team. Your opportunities and threats are external to your team. Strengths and opportunities are obviously positive. Weaknesses and threats are obviously negative. So here's a sample one. Um, this is taken from part of 971's SWOT analysis. So you can see one of the things that we think is a strength of the team is our technical knowledge. An opportunity is the number of teams in the area. And some of the negatives is just the amount of stuff going on, both for our internal student body and mentor body. We're, we're very busy. A lot of our mentors work for startups. Or the amount of events in the area, right? Because there are so many teams. There's just so much going on. And if you were in this situation, well, one of the things you might decide to do is run Spartan Series. You might decide to grow it, which we've done this year. And so that was kind of how we got here, is it was actually based on looking at what is our team Doing? What's our environment look like in doing this SWOT analysis? And so that's how we ended up here today. All right, the second bit is engage. So you've evaluated your situation, and as your awards and outreach team, you think, ah, OK, we, we know what we're going to do. We, we know some things that could work. Um, we're going to go, and we're going to volunteer at a soup kitchen. And so you go, and, and you talk to your team, and you say, yes, we're gonna, I need everyone to go volunteer at a soup kitchen. Or I need you all to give a presentation or to deal with small children, or we're going to go and uh, talk to some media, or we're going to go to what could be dreaded, I think it would have been dreaded in my case, a high school rally with the robot. And for probably someone on your team, or maybe everyone on your team, at least one of those is going to be their definition of hell. They would rather like pull out every hair on their head before they would go and do that. And so I think the key bit of this is that you actually have to engage with the team to know what they're interested in. It can't just be, we're going to go do X, because maybe the kids on your team don't like X. Or maybe you have a team full of kids that want to go in and be preschool teachers, and so the thought of working with five-year-olds just it lights them up. Not me so much, but sometimes there are, ki there are kids who love doing this, right? And we want to encourage that. So I think this is all based on a broken model, and I love this little meme. I think it really encapsulates it. <laughs> it's not actually leadership skills, right? If you're telling them what to do, you need to engage with them. You need to help the whole team figure out what you want to do, because it's about everyone. You can't have everyone involved with outreach if you don't engage everyone and you don't consult with them. So I think a better model is collaborating and talking about this. So hopefully I've sold you on this idea. Because now it comes to my 30. See, I actually did good branding on this one, um, which is execute. So you want to engage. How do you do it? 
So the way this looks like on 3132 is we have an outreach kickoff meeting every year and we sit down and we brainstorm. We think about both what are problems in our community we want to fix, what are solutions that we want to do, and we have a whiteboard just chock full of it. Like the whiteboard, we had one from a couple years ago that didn't get erased for years. It was this size and I mean it was just filled with ideas. Now obviously we're not going to be able to do all of that in a single year, but those are the basic things that we're interested in. That someone on the team said, hey, you know what? I'm interested in that. I want to go do that. That sounds fun to me. Things may stay on that whiteboard for, we probably had stuff on that whiteboard for eight years um, that we just started doing. So it's about also finding the right time to do it and having a big enough group to do it. So some things do get carried over from year to year on the whiteboard, but you gotta have someone interested in it. And then we pare down from that using a process and we end up with a handful of projects that we're actually gonna work on for that year. Um, the Compass Alliance, I don't know, have people heard of the Compass Alliance? Yeah, couple? The Compass Alliance was on that whiteboard for five years. Not as the Compass Alliance, as something else, but it turned into the Compass Alliance. But that, I, that general idea of getting a group of teams together to do something sat on the whiteboard for five years for us. Um, but what this means is when you have the kids brainstorm the ideas and the mentors, someone on the team is passionate about it. And if someone on the team is passionate about it, they're going to want to go do it and they're going to make it happen. So that's how you end up with, you know, working with five-year-olds because someone wants to be a teacher, yes. So when you say it sat on the whiteboard for five years, does that mean you were doing it for five years? Or you, you, okay, you didn't do it. We didn't do it for five years, yeah. It just sat there as a, we'd like to work with a bunch of teams. We'd like to get a bunch of teams together and do something together. And we think there'd be something really powerful in partnering with nine other teams around the world. So that's kind of the way in which... If it sits on the whiteboard, it's not happening. When it comes off the whiteboard is when we do it or decide it can't happen. Um, another thing that was on that board for years was get another regional in the country. Um, that was the first big thing on the whiteboard for years. All right, so when you start doing this, what does it look like in practice? Well, all of a sudden, our outreach no longer looks like this. It looks like this. Um, so these are some of the things that have been done in the past Oh, probably about four years. Um, so these are actually three middle school girls who they, it's a little different in Australia, but effectively middle school girls who when they got to middle school, their middle school didn't have a team, uh, any robotics team. And so they asked if they could join our FRC team. And we said, well, you're a little young, you're like 12, but um, let's see what we can do. We at the same time had some students really passionate about water safety. One of them had actually saved her sister from a riptide when she'd been 12 years old. So they ended up creating a FLL style game that teaches kids about water safety. And because these three had done FLL for the past three years, they designed the game, they developed the rules and everything. So it can look like that. It can look like augmented reality on your team's handout because a student gets really excited about it. Um, this one I'm particularly excited about. Um, we're developing a smart, a smart watch application or a Fitbit application that will allow women to track their blood iron levels over time because um, one in three women suffer from low um, blood iron levels, which is the most common mineral or vitamin deficiency in the world, according to the World Health Organization. So instead of having to go get regular blood tests, their smart watch will be able to do it for them and say, hey, your iron levels are going up or they're going down. Um, or on 971, right, we've got these great shirts that people love. They were for sale this morning, and that table was very, very busy. Some of you probably have some new 971 apparel in your bag. That's a form of outreach. All right, so the three E's for how do we get started. Evaluate, engage, execute. All right, so my final question, how do we get more people involved? And remember, I said I'd save the the outrageous outreach for the end and you're going to about to find out. Well, in Australian schools, and I don't know if it's this way, in, I'm assuming it's this way in England as well, it's just actually like Harry Potter. We have houses. So this wasn't something they made up for the Harry Potter universe. We actually have them. And so on 3132, the team is divided into four alliances. There's red, blue, yellow, green, and they don't actually have the names from Harry Potter, but it made a good graphic. Um, and so the whole team is divided into these four alliances. And on Fridays, Friday is always the team meeting in season and out of season. But during season, we have dinner. So the parents make dinner and bring it in um, an hour before the meeting starts. And that first hour, we have Fun Friday. 
And during Fun Friday, we play lots of games. So this has looked differently over the years, and we've kind of built it up to where it is today. But these days, the favorite game of all the 3132 students is Jeopardy. So they're on their four alliances, they're in different parts of the room. Uh, normally I develop the questions, or well, the answers and the questions, because you say the answer, right? Um, and I say the answer, and then they have to ask the question. Um, but all of the answers and all of the questions are about our outreach activities. And so it's become a really great way for everyone on the team to know the history of the team, to understand the importance of the history of the team, and to just learn about our outreach or our statistics. There's a lot of numbers that 3132 throws around. And it's really hard to remember them if I just sat you down and said, OK, class, today we're going to be learning about how many people we've reached. That's not very fun. Jeopardy is fun. Um, the way it also works is technically uh, they could pick another game. It goes out normally on Monday. I would say we had Slack at the time. I would say if you're going to be coming this Friday, your choices are Jeopardy or Password was another good one. Um, you know, react with this if you want Jeopardy and this if you want Password. And eventually I stopped sending out the messages because everyone kept saying Jeopardy. Um, if people are interested, I can show you what this looks like afterwards. I just forgot to put it in a slide. But I have it set up in a spreadsheet, and it's actually pretty easy to do. Um, the other way I think we get more people involved is we just have fun. So the activities we do can be a bit strange at times, but they're a good time. So this is in Australia, because Christmas is in the summer, there are these big events called carols. People go to big parks and run like. They sing Christmas carols, and we work with the Rotary to do one in our area, and we make all the sausages that they sell, and all the proceeds go to help bring kids from third world countries to Australia for life-saving and changing medical operations. Um, and then this was, we were in New Hampshire, and we sent out a message on our social media channels of, we're going to be at this ice cream stand at this time. If anyone wants to meet us, come by and say hi, and there were about 50 people who turned up, which was an incredibly fun night just having ice cream because we put it up on Facebook. Um, and the other reason <laughs> that we have fun is this is now the 971 motto, because we can. That's why we do these things, right? Um, because we can, and we can influence our community and can have a good time doing it. All right, and my third reason of how we get more people involved is not actually McDonald's. Um, <laughs> though maybe that would work on your team. If it does, kudos, I guess. Um, is supersizing projects. So everyone wants to be part of something that's fun and exciting and is the next big thing, right? You want to, if something's growing, people are normally, they gravitate towards it. So Robots in the Outback was a program that we started in 2015 in one small town of 120 people. There were about 10 kids in the entire K through 12 school. And we were able to bring first into a community like that. Well, over the years, the program has grown and grown, and now it's something that we call robots around the world, because not only are we doing it in outback communities, we're doing it with homeless populations in Sydney, we're doing it in the Navajo Nation here in Utah. But that was a fun program because it was growing, right? We got, ended up getting over a million dollars from Google.org in order to make this happen. And when you're growing a project like that, it's fun and exciting, and people want to be drawn towards it. So this is just one example of that happening. I could give you many, many others. But supersizing projects and looking at the growth and trying to make it exponential creates, creates a really fun challenge, and people will be drawn towards it. So, oh, and this is the other thing. Why do we build robots? Right? If you went on your team, everyone there is probably there because they like building robots, or at least most of them. And I think you'll find that those three reasons are three of the reasons that they want to build robots. So not only is this true for why we do, how we should get more people involved with outreach, it's also why we build the robots. And I think a lot of lessons from the robot can transition over to outreach, if you just think about it in a little bit of a creative way. OK, so this was the agenda at the start. What should we do? Those are the three answers. How do we get started? And how do we get more people involved? So good summary slide. Any questions? Besides the fact that I really raced through that. <laughs> yes? How do you measure the impact? It depends on the project. So um, and this is one of the interesting things, right? Sorry, oh, great. Yes, the question was, how do you measure the impact? So the interesting thing is, I don't think it's based purely on numbers. Right? So we could measure the impact of Spartan series by how many people turn up or how many people watch the video online. But I, 
if we're giving presentations that say nothing new, then we actually didn't have any impact. So it's also through things like the feedback survey we're going to ask all of you to do and is on your little sheet of paper. Um, it's really about looking at true impact, I think, not just what's the biggest number I can throw out at you. So robots in the outback, we went to a town of 120. Number-wise, that doesn't make any sense. That's silly. When I could go to a high school that has 1,000 kids, why would I go to a town of 120? But the impact we have in that town of 120 is massive because those kids aren't going to go to college. They're not, they may not even finish high school, to be honest. And if we get even one of them to finish high school, that's big impact. So it depends on the project, which I know is a terrible answer. I think that's kind of one of my points of this presentation is there are no good answers because it depends. Yeah. So, so what was the impetus to go to that particular town of 120 people? So it all started because the president of Macquarie University, which is the home and major sponsor of 3132, was from that town. And he challenged us at the, as we were growing the program, he said, could we bring this to my hometown? And us being Americans and not really thinking about it said, yeah, sure, why not? And they said, okay, it's Ivanhoe. And he said, oh, okay. And then we Googled it um, and went, oh, okay, we're, we're looking at a whole new scale of a challenge here, a whole new problem that we didn't realize we had. But we said we were going to do it, so why not? <laughs> um, and that's how we got started out there. And then once we did the one town, the impact was just so massive that Google got really excited about the program, Ford got really excited about the program, and they said, how can we grow this? How can we make this scale better? And that's what caused the growth of it. Um, and we started going to more and more towns, and it worked really well. I mean, these kids, <laughs> they have nothing. Like, some of these teams in the Outback, it's a two-hour drive to Home Depot One Direction. So it's a four hour round trip just to get to the local hardware store. Um, but they love the program and it has such impact on the kids that the teachers and parents are willing to drive four hours. That's the key there. Yes, the, the key is the teachers and the parents, depending on who's running the team. Whoever there wants to, is the driving force is the key, in especially small communities. The real key is trying to keep them there because a lot of teachers will go in when they're fresh out of college, 22, and by the time they're 25, they want to get married, and in order, well, they go back to the city, basically. So, yeah. So, I, I understand the, the things you're trying to do, but who on the team drives them and does them? Because are they doing anything with the robot, or are you doing this not in build season, and, and you only do this in certain times of the year? How do you work? that with the team, that's what I don't understand how to do outreach, is who has time for it? So it depends on your team. Um, so on 31, 32, it's a combination of both. So we have some students who just really love outreach and that's what they do. Um, we also have the fact that um, my mom and I were the outreach mentors and that was our focus throughout the season, um, all year round. We did we did some work on the robot. I'm the lead deburrer for 3132. If anyone needs help deburring, I'm your gal. Um, but that was, our focus was always on the awards and the outreach. And when you have excited, passionate mentors, you get passionate kids, right? You, you kind of, you, if you make it exciting, kids become excited. Um, a lot of kids will come up to me and say, I want to get outreach started on my team. And I say, great, do you have a mentor? No. Step one, I think, is find a mentor because the mentor is going to be able to guide you and lead you and, and help you get more kids excited. Um, there are other teams who don't do it that way. They will only do it in the off season. They have their chairman's essay written before kickoff, and that's it because all of their outreach and chairman's kids are also on the robot side and very heavily involved, so they can't do it that way. So another, it, it's up to your team answer. Um, but I've seen both ways work. I do think it's important to have kids who, at least in the off season, are looking at it and focused on it and have that team, that core team. But, you know, you can't, <laughs> you can't have, you know, five people go and do all that. You, you need to have the broader team. And that's where I think the engage comes in. It's more have your small team engage with the big team. Is that sort of answer? Mm -hmm. um, on 31 32, the outreach team also met a different night from the robot team, so kids could do both during the off season. So the whole team meets Fridays, and the outreach team would meet Tuesdays. 
We picked those days for no reasons other than they worked for us. Yes. So you talked a lot about 3132. I'm curious what, what your role is now um, with 971. Are you still doing outreach? Yes. Are you an outreach mentor? Yes. Yeah, so I only moved here two months ago, which is why a lot of this is focused on 3132 because I've been here eight weeks. Um, I'm getting there though. Um, so we're starting to bring over some of this mentality and thinking, but of course it looks really different because as half my answers were, it's up to your team. So when you have a different team in a different environment, you end up with different things. So it's more about that general philosophy than anything really specific. You're also doing software, right? Oh yeah, I'm also a software mentor because I'm a software engineer. So <laughs> I haven't started writing code yet, but I'm going to. Um, I also did some software on 3132, and um, this past season I was also um, our lead scouting mentor, so strategy and scouting as well. Yeah? Um, I guess we were wondering, how did you get involved with 971 if you had so much experience with um, your Australian team? Um, well, I moved. You just moved and you just reached out and they were finally... Yeah, so I help a lot of teams with their chairman submissions um, because... 3132 wasn't submitting anymore because we couldn't, so I offered out to any team that would want help. And so I helped about, last year I helped about a dozen teams around the world, um, literally around the world and many continents. So the offer is out there. If you want help on your chairman submission, please let me know. I love reviewing chairman's essays and the strategy and stuff. Um, yes? I was going to be, I was, again, I'm just going to ask, but I don't know that my team member or my students want me to ask, but I only see one here, so I don't know if he cares. But um, I have heard that uh, rookie teams or newer teams, we're not a rookie anymore, I guess we're second year, but newer teams should not even put it on their horizons for a couple of years, like 10 years. Is that like, and I've heard it from other teams' students and mentors. So being fairly new to the world of work, I am a, I'm a mentor on the team and I come from the school of like, if you want something, do it. You know, go for it. But I don't know, is that like totally inappropriate support from a new, for a new team? No. Yeah, I, I totally know what you're trying to ask. And I don't, I think the answer is no. Um, I know a lot of people will say, you shouldn't go for chairmans. There's not even a chance you're going to win it for five years. And don't even think about championship chairmans because you have to be at least 10 years old in order to win it. That's what I'm hearing. 3132 was eight years old when we won it at championship. And it's because we didn't believe that. <laughs> we didn't believe it. And so we went off and we chased it. And we got our first regional chairman's award our second year. And we won it at eight years old. And we are the only team still two years in in the 3000s in the Hall of Fame. I think that it's a self-perpetuating myth, right? If everyone says you can't win chairman's in your first five years, don't even bother, then no one bothers. And no one wins chairman's in their first five years. So everyone says you can't win chairman's in your first five years. It's a cycle, right? <laughs> If you just break the cycle and say, well, why, okay, maybe we're not going to win it, but it goes back to that really, really early slide. If you're doing chairmans to win chairmans, then you're not doing chairmans. Yeah. So, and that's why I was hesitant to ask, because I could hear our two team captains say, why do you even care? Because we're not doing it for Blue Banner. We're doing it because our community, where we're from, which is not this area, um, is really slow in STEM. Like STEM, when we ask the grade school kids, what does STEM mean? It's, it's part of plans. a plan. Part of a plan. You know, they think, they think fingers, they think fruits, they think, but not what it is, you know, for us. And so that's their drug drive for them. Yeah, I, I just wondering. I think it's a self-perpetuating myth. I think if you look over the history of the Chairman's Award, every season you have a couple teams who in their second or third year win a regional Chairman's Award. And I think it's because they're the teams who say, okay, everyone said this, but doesn't mean they're right. Yeah. Just because they have a low team number doesn't mean they're right. Right? They're teams with three-digit numbers who've never won a regional chairman's award. Or competition. Or competition. W would you, like, it doesn't, just because they say something and they have a three-digit team number doesn't mean they're right. Right? Because my shirt says 971 doesn't make me an expert on software. There might be people on the team who are experts in software. I might be one of them, but it doesn't necessarily mean that, right? Like, figure out what they are actually experts in. Other questions? Yes. So for our rookie team, we're also trying to do outreach. So how do you, like, allocate resources to, like, 
outreach and also figuring out how to build a robot and like competitions and everything? Like, what should we focus on? Um, well, as a rookie team, you're not eligible for chairmans is the first thing. You're only eligible for the Rookie All-Star Award. Um, honestly, I'm not really a good person to ask because our rookie season was about survival. Um, <laughs> we were the only team on the continent. It was about where can I find an imperial bearing on the continent. Um, it wasn't anything more than that, which, I mean, there was some outreach, but it was mostly where can I find an imperial bearing in the country? Very hard question. Um, I think the important thing is figuring out what you want your team culture to be and how you're going to develop that. You don't get a second chance at a first start. So if you can get the culture right from the beginning, it's going to make everything easier. So it's, do you want to be an outreach team? Do you want to be a robot team? Do you want to do both? I don't know the answers. It's up to you guys in your community. I mean, there's nothing wrong with saying our team is about inspiring the kids on our team. We're going to focus on building a good robot and we're going to inspire the kids on our team. There are teams who have that philosophy and that's totally fine. You could at the same point in time say, we want to go and inspire our community. We think it's really, really important to engage with our broader audience. Right, I said 32 and 32's goal was survival. Well, when you're the only team on the continent, you need people to know about you. Otherwise, how are you going to survive? How do you find sponsors if no one knows what FIRST is? How do you find students if no one knows what FIRST is? How do you, how do, you do any of that when you don't even have a robot to go show them? When all I have is a video, it, it becomes a lot harder to sell it. And there's nothing on the continent. Right? It's not like I can go say, hey, 971, can I borrow your robot just to show people? Could, would you mind coming and doing a demo? There's no one. So that was kind of why outreach became so important to us from the very beginning was because it was about surviving. And that's what we needed to survive. Um, so that's your step one is, is don't die. Um, <laughs> and step two, I think, is set a good culture and figure out what you guys want that culture to be. Y you can't inspire anyone if you die. Step one has to be about team survival, no matter who you are, right? Hopefully I don't watch this video. But if you're 254, step one is still survival, right? <laughs> if they go away tomorrow, that, right? If Bellarmine said you guys can't have the team here anymore, if NASA said you're no longer a house team, what would they do? There are probably many things they could do, but step one for them is about survival. Yes? About survival is reaching out to those that are going to feed into the team and nurturing them. So that's part of survival. Mm -hmm. So FLL, FTC, whatever, you know, the kids coming up, reaching out to the elementary schools, junior highs, your feeders, figure out where your feeder chains are, and trying to get those good kids and their parents. <laughs> Parents are a very powerful force. Um, very powerful. <laughs> well, they started because their kids were in the program. My parents got involved because I was in the program, like, and we're still all here. So don't underestimate the power of a dedicated parent. They can stick around a very long time. Hi, I'm Travis, and a mentor on Team 971. We hope you enjoyed this video. For more videos and resources, please subscribe and visit our website, frc971.org.